It's bedtime, way past my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> I will be in bed at 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> no, but L Laura asked me to do a bit of preaching on the accessioning, which I always love, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hi, John. Hi, Rob. Well, Hello, hi, John. Hi, uh, Rob. Folks I don't know yet. My name's Rob. Uh, I work with fish at the Florida Museum, same as Laura. Okay. Hello, Sarah, who I don't know, and Amsterdam, you're going to have to pronounce your name yeah, for Yeah, I was just going to change it into Didi, because Dievertje is too difficult. Say it again. Dievertje. Dievertje. I like that. It, it, it means protector of the people. Oh. oh wow. You I should know. always know what your name means. Mine means beloved of God, so. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, he regret, God regrets that now. <laughs> Or higher callings. Those are both uh, tough to live up to, but wish you guys the best. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I wish my parents knew before they called me this. So. <laughs> <laughs> parents should always look at the meaning of that name. Yeah, you think so, right? No. Yeah. It's a quite an unusual name, so they should. I, I, I named my daughter Sophia because I knew she would be smart. So. Choice. And sorry, John, you were from? Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, live in Pennsylvania in the United States. I used to be at <clears throat> University of Kansas for many, many years. And I now uh, work as a museum consultant. Nice. Oh, it's fun. I do whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> Except currently that means nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult, right? Uh, yeah. I have actually have plenty to do, so I'm not mm. terribly worried. Oh, that's a good thing. There's someone new. Marie Angel. Mary Angel. Mary Angel. Hello. Hi. Hi. Email from the list serv, so I thought I'd hop on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were just sort of introducing ourselves. Some of us know each other, but uh, others were just kind of getting to know each other. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm a curatorial assistant in geology at the California Academy of Sciences. Cool. Yeah. I'm my former place of work. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I, I was there from 76 to 81. Oh, it's a little bit before my time. <laughs> yeah, back when those about, back when those know. rocks were young. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I went. I, I started out as a zookeeper and um, decided I liked dead animals better, so I left the zoo <laughs> and went to California Academy of Sciences. Awesome. Marie, dead animals, are your yeah. are your exhibits open now? Is the public back in with social distancing or no, none of that? Not yes, yet, no. we are. Uh, you, guys are? Or, you asked me, right? I'd ask Marie. But Marie, uh, I thought you said Didi. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's fine. No, yeah. Go ahead, Marie. Uh, no, we are, we're still closed to the public. Um, some staff are going in on a very occasional basis. Um, of course, our biologists and engineers are there keeping the building and running and the animals fed, but the public floor uh, is still closed. That's a significant loss of revenue. Absolutely, yeah. Dee, Dee you guys, you said you are open? We're open again, yes. And we, we have COVID measures that were only 50 people allowed, but now they changed museums in other places that you walk through. I don't know how to say that better so libraries uh, museums uh, mm. other places there are allowed more people as long as you can keep your one and a half meter distance but i we think are. that we have a slightly less lesser problem uh, regarding revenues because we have all most of all our museums are listen? I can take subsidized off that's uh, an interesting concept that we seem uh, not able to wrap our minds around here in the United States. <laughs> it's changing here, I'm afraid, but... We, uh, our exhibit hall is open again, and my understanding from the people who work there, I work in the collections and research facility, separate buildings, 
is that they are trying to do social distancing, but they aren't always succeeding to the degree that the staff would find comfortable. So they recently had a, an event for a new exhibit, and I think they had 900 people at the event. Oh, wow. And the, the, the galleries, now not necessarily all at the same time, but that day they had visitation of 900 people. And to put that in perspective, we typically get about 200,000 people a year. So a th a, nearly 1,000 people on a single day is a very big day. And it's worked out. Don't know. That was within the last week. So, and it's <laughs> very hard to do reliable contact tracing um, mm -hmm. or not hard to do. Obviously it's easy to do if you put the resources together, but it's being done um, inconsistently uh, from community to community in the United States. We have, we have no federal leadership. I mean, that's, I think I can make that an objective statement here. We have no leadership from the top down. There's no, esprit de corps, there's no, hey, we're all in this together, like World War II, there's just, hey, you all figure it out for yourselves. Right. That's where we're at. Sorry. Laura, this is your meeting. We'll let you tell us why we're all here. <laughs> okay. I think that is time to start formally our meetup. And thank you so much for, for being here. Um, as I said in my first meetup, I decided to create this club because um, I want to get a better understand, understanding of my field. So this is my second year in my museum studies program here at EUF. And I'm new in the country, I knew in the language, I knew with everything. And this is a big challenge for me as well, but it's, it's something that, that I want to do because I'm, I really love collections and I'm very interesting. So I was looking for um, a different a space from the academic. And I would like to have this space where students, where volunteers, where emerging professionals can discuss about uh, some powerful literature. Because uh, I have realized that we have like the, the article that we are going to discuss in today that is very nice and very interesting. But when you go to the, like, the real work life, some things are very different. And it's um, um, and also I want to have this space to to ask to say to speak out or opinions or thoughts or feelings and yeah so welcome if if you all want uh, we can do like a check in and I I have a, like an icebreaker activity so the idea is that you can. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, the question is if you were an object or a specimen what would you like to be so if someone want to start and and nominate the next person i think john's a good person to start <laughs> oh thanks rob yeah, it's really nice well since I'm the only one here that's actually old enough to be a museum specimen, <laughs> um, let me see. Okay, so my name's John, and I, I run a museum consulting service. I've been in the business for 50 years. And so I used to be a zookeeper in Texas, and then I was at California Academy of Sciences as collection manager, and then at University of Kansas as a collection manager, and I also ran the museum studies program there for six years. And I've been here in Pennsylvania since 2008 and uh, with the consulting and I do a fair amount of teaching and, and other work. And that's actually how I met Laura is um, met her in Colombia in Bogota at the university. So let's see if I was going to be a specimen, I, I guess I would have to say I would like to be a holotype of a really interesting frog because that's what I worked on back when I was a collections manager was spent most of my life working with tropical frogs and uh, that's I go, I'll go with that. Um, the idea is to nominate someone else, uh, John. Who okay, well then I'm going to stick it back on Rob. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, at least we're going to get the old guys out of the way first. So uh, I'll keep it brief. I have a little less history, but I've been at the Florida Museum of Natural History as the ichthyology collection manager 
since 1996, and we're a large collection of specimens. Not a lot of people realize that we're second only to Michigan, I think, as a university-based museum in the United States. Our fish collection is about 8,000 species, and we work hard to curate the data there to get a clean number of species count. Um, it's a great place to work. Really enjoy being on a university campus. If I were to be a specimen, um, I've already decided to, that people can do with my body what they want after I'm gone. So I'm just going to be a human cadaver specimen one day, I hope. But it um, doesn't really matter what I want because I'll be gone. And uh, I'm going to go random. I don't know Sarah well, but I'm going to pick Sarah. Nominate Sarah. Okay. To pick up. Hi, I'm Sarah. I am the collections manager for the herbarium at the University of Connecticut. And I've been a botanist for about 20 years. Um, I went to undergraduate here in Connecticut because that's where I grew up. And then I got my PhD at the University of Texas. And I've traveled around. I've been really lucky to live in a whole lot of different places. So I've explored the botany of Texas and Mexico and Colorado and the Canadian Rockies, and South Carolina, the Blackwater swamps in South Carolina. So it's been really, really cool, but I like being back home in New England. Um, and I love working in a herbarium. For me, it's the perfect balance of being in a really intellectually stimulating academic environment, but also I get to spend a ton of time just by myself with my specimens. So I, I really love it a lot. And um, our university is doing okay with, with COVID right now. And so I am on site two days a week. Um, our herbarium is part of an integrated collection, so the herbarium is in the same facility as our vertebrates and invertebrates and paleobotany collections. Um, so I have other collections managers, colleagues, and it's really fun to be with people who uh, specialize in other taxa. And right now we split up the week, so I go in two days a week and the other collections managers are in other days. And I think if I was going to be an object or a specimen, I probably would pick some kind of a hawthorn because those are my favorite uh, herbarium specimens. I just love those super, super long spines. And I think they're really cool. So <laughs> that's probably what I would be. Um, okay, because I don't know who's here from the Matheson Museum. That's who I'll call on. Can you all hear me? I'm having a lot of technical difficulties right now. Uh, I'm trying to zoom in from my phone and my computer is throwing a tantrum. That's okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so this is Caitlin Hoff Mahoney. I'm the curator of collections at the Matheson Museum. Uh, I'm trying to get video going. Uh, my computer has been restarting for about 10 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so we are a, a history museum in Gainesville, Florida, and we have been closed since March. Uh, so that's been weird not having people come in, but it has also been nice because we've had lots of time to work on some of the collections projects that we don't normally have time for. Uh, so it's I were an object, I would say, uh, hmm. well, the first thing that came to mind uh, currently is, you know, something, maybe one of our newspapers that's fragile and under a lot of stress. <laughs> I think. Hey, there you are. Yep. <laughs> Here I am. Okay, great. Um, so now that I have got that fixed, um, I think maybe I would be a postcard. Um, those are some of my favorite things that we have in our collection. <laughs> uh, we have postcards from Al Alachua County, and we also have historic postcards from uh, the rest of the state of Florida. And those are some of my favorite things that we have. 
doesn't matter what I'm looking for. There always seems to be a postcard that's applicable. So, yeah, I'm going to make Marie to go next. Uh, so like I said earlier, uh, my name is Marie and I'm a curatorial assistant in geology at the California Academy of Sciences. I've been there about two and a half years. I actually don't have any sort of geology or paleontology background. Uh, my master's is in museum studies and I have a certificate in collections management and care. So I learn a lot about geology and minerals and paleo on the job, which is always really fun. <laughs> uh, it's always something new to learn, of course. Um, and since we've been working from home the past six, seven months, um, mainly been doing data entry and working on digitizing our collections. Um, we have two big grants and NSF grants in our department right now. Um, one is uh, digitizing our, our Eastern Pacific Cenozoic um, invertebrates. And another one is focusing on our um, Forum collection and digitizing that collection. So we've been trying to do as much as we can from home. Um, now our collections manager is going in two days a week starting in October and our other curatorial assistant in our department is going in one day a week. So just to kind of keep Keep things going within our department um, and if I had to be a specimen I think I would pick some kind of trilobite just because they're so weird looking but also because they survived for millions of years and they're pretty pretty hardy animals <laughs> and I think I'll go to D you're the only person who hasn't gone yet <laughs> or Laura I, uh, I like going. Well, I'm Dieberje, Didi, from Amsterdam. I specialized in deaccessioning over 10 years ago, already thinking that there would never be any issue in the whole museum management. And then five years ago, six, seven years ago, it started booming. I'm a museum, independent museum consultant myself. Uh, have been working all through COVID. So it's been very busy. A lot of museums are assessing their collections and uh, next to collection strategies as I call it I do work on participation heritage participation so I'm changing my spectrum a bit to more the people oriented um, spectrum of museum work although I still love being on my own in a storage space with only objects like a golem <laughs> walking around noticing things, discovering things. And if I were to be a museum object, I think I would really love to be a paintbrush by Vincent van Gogh. I think that that paintbrush could tell really interesting stories. And I think that stories are the main subject of museums and objects help tell the stories. Laura. Uh, I'm Laura. I'm from Colombia and I'm doing my master in museum studies here at um, UF and, uh, and I would like to be maybe a clear and stained specimen because it's the collection that I'm interested now and that's the only thing that I know <laughs> because I'm learning uh, this semester about collections management and I'm, I will be working with the geology collection and those specimens are really beautiful. So I don't know if if maybe Didi or Kaitlin know about the clear and stained specimen, but is this like fish that are preserved in glycerin? And for example, um, this specimen has two colors. Like the, the red one stands for the bones, like highlight all the bones in, in red. And the blue stands for um, car cartilage. Okay, cartilage. So it's very beautiful because it's a colorful a fish in a jar. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, um, related with the article, I have many, many opinions and thoughts about it. I think that is super, super interesting. And in my opinion, I, I, I realized that through the article, um, how museums used to be and maybe have been uh, struggling with uh, the sessioning, but at the same time, at the same time with um, acquisition, because museums uh, didn't have like any control over its practices. Um, for example, the article has many interesting quotes, but one of these quotes uh, was related about the Brooklyn Museum's first dates back in 1983. And they say that they took just about anything that was offered and told maybe someday it will be useful. And I related all these things maybe with human nature because it's, it's like our instinct to be hoarders. Like, as for example, um, like in our parents' house, they have like a room full of stuff and and I related this comment about told maybe someday it will be useful. And it's the same, it's like, hey, mom, you should get rid of this object. And they are like, no, and you don't want to be like that. But when I think about me, it's the same thing. Like, it's this very powerful connection that we have with objects. So right now, I'm like, I have, and, and how we, like how we have an or or how we have a relation with them or how i feel identified with with those objects so so yeah so i understand where it does come from so i related this a lot with the with the human nature and yeah and i have many questions but we can like discuss about this and hear your opinion mm -hmm. Can I say something in regard to this? Because I think it's really interesting that we have natural history and botanical collections here, and you, Caitlin, have an historical collection, right? Because I think that accessioning and deaccessioning for natural history collections and botanical collections are completely different from art museums and, and historical museums. I, I would presume to agree, but not having experience with the art and historical museums, I don't know for sure. I, I certainly know that in our case, in our experience, we have essentially treated deaccession as something of a triage process. We've certainly um, been prone as an institution, particularly given particular individuals and their personality traits with a, given a lot of autonomy, as most faculty are, to take on items that perhaps were less valuable into spaces that really are limited and should be reserved for things that are objectively more valuable. And so I, I certainly had to, to deal with some of the fallout of that in my career at the Florida Museum, and we use triage, right? And we look at stuff and, and say, is it missing data, right? Because for us, Principally, if you don't know its provenience, if you don't know where the animal is from or when it was collected, it becomes nearly valueless for the majority use case scenarios. And after that, if it has very poor condition or is degraded, that's something to consider for throwing it out. And particularly if it's both of those things and that's a done deal, you know, you throw it out. But even when something becomes a done deal, and I see some nodding heads around here, that still takes a lot of work. So I'm, I'm keenly interested in the problem of non-native fishes in Florida. And the way you get, the way you solve that problem is to don't let it happen in the first place. So I'm very keen on not taking on materials that you're not ever going to accession. And fortunately, the curator, who sets the research agenda for our division, and I have tended to agree very strongly on that point. We don't take large unfunded collections anymore. There's not funding in place to actually process and accession the materials in a targeted time frame. We don't take them. Yeah, 
Didi, could you elaborate more on why you think it is different, the uh, deaccessioning in an art museum or a history museum compared to a natural history? Well, I when I th I talk from the, the Dutch situation, uh, mm -hmm. I think the natural history museums uh, and botanical museums tend to uh, accession on an encyclopedia level. Mm -hmm. So you want every change in stage available because you want to be able to research it. And I think art museums, they don't, they, they collect on a different level thinking what was the main, um, what was the best phase of this artist? When was the turning point when he changed from his pink period to his blue period, Picasso, for instance. Uh, and you think about artistic value, so it, it's more, um, it's not encyclopedia, but curatorial. I don't think, I don't know if that's the right words. No, I, I think I, I might disagree with you because there's certainly uh, a difference in scale because natural history and botanical collections are going to have far more objects than art or history collections. But it's still, you are acquiring objects because they're useful to you for some reason for a research. And so you have your, whatever criteria you have that you apply to and either the objects are, in this case, the specimens of plants or animals are used or they're not and therefore can be deaccessioned or not. But it's, I think it is, it is very similar in, in what goes on. It's just the, the, the case of the scale. And in, in an art museum, you're dealing with far fewer objects, but you're still looking at the quality of the object, how it's going to be used, does it fit your mission, all of those other, other criteria. True. The same criteria yeah. that you'd use really with natural history. Yeah, if you look at that way, it's true. I, I say this because my, my daughter is the head of collections management at Spencer Museum of Art at University of Kansas. So we have had this discussion before about how, how similar and how, how different are they. And I think uh, the, the scale tends to throw people off when they look at natural history and they see thousands and thousands and thousands of things. But we're pretty well doing the same thing other museums do, just in a, in a different way. And, and some of our reasons for deaccessioning would be different. For instance, natural history museums, and particularly herbarium do a lot more exchanging of specimens. And that would mean deaccessioning them to trade or to give to another museum. They do a lot more of that than other museums, but other museums do that too, just not at that same scale. Well, the stuff that we exchange though has never actually been accessioned. It's stuff that, you know, when you went out and collected your plant, you collected three or four of them and you keep one and you send the other three away. Yeah, herbaria are unique in that way, I think, because I think most most uh, people that work with animals will bring in their collection, accession it, get it identified, and then begin making trades or depositing things in other institutions. But yes, I've been in the field with botanists and I have, I've heard them having this discussion about how many specimens to collect because they have agreements outstanding with other herbaria for those exchanges, so. Yeah. I, I mean, Maybe it's because botanists trust each other to exchange, but, but animal people are always wanting to trade to see if they can get a better deal. Oh, I, I wonder if that's becoming a practice of the past as collections become better connected. And I say that because in some 23 years now at the Florida Museum, we do almost no exchanges of specimens with other institutions. And I know I have paperwork that documents exchanges. We just don't do it anymore. No one initiates it and I don't initiate them. So it just seems like because everybody's data now at least at the large natural history museums is digitized and online. Everybody knows what you have and you just borrow it when you, when you need to. So I, I, I realize this is just one aspect of a larger conversation about how museums hold oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Sarah, do, are your botanists still collecting sufficient specimens to fulfill exchange agreements when they collect? Yes, although we don't actually have that many ongoing formal agreements, but it's not well before COVID. It wasn't uncommon for me to just come into the herbarium one day and find a box of specimens on the desk that just showed up from New York or Harvard or Brown or wherever. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't want to, I don't, maybe we're not more worried about, 
I just feel like herbarium specimens are so fragile and so easy to destroy and we worry all the time about fire that we still want to have duplicates at other places because we worry so much about things happening to our collection. I mean like when the Pringle herbarium was saved by firefighters but just watching that video of all the smoke pouring out of the windows from the herbarium was like terrifying. I and think they do that with the Picasso Museum as well. I mm -hmm. think they'd be terrified if there was yeah. fire. Like any museum, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I think, and we also emphasize a lot that, you know, you can't get DNA out of your image of a specimen or out of your database record. So you still need to have the specimen itself. So anyway, among the herbarium community, it is still really common to send duplicates to other places is the short answer. Well, Rob's comment is interesting because I have not worked actively in a natural history collection now for 12 years. And I think it's quite, yeah, that is interesting. Things have changed. But I can see that you're, Rob, the things you mentioned about digitization and availability of the specimens in the databases and availability of databases through the internet should change all that. It make, should make it a lot easier to borrow rather than to trade. That's interesting. Yeah. And of course, we still have, you know, the same under chronic underfunding problems that don't really <laughs> yeah. invite you to take on new initiatives like, hey, I wonder why we don't have a sea moth in our collection. Could I get yeah. one? You know? well, well, I guess one nice. of the, yeah. and I think one of the big differences is, is that what happens after deaccessioning, which is the disposal of things, because in art museums, you are frequently talking about the potential to gain large amounts of money. And in history, I think you have that possibility, but not quite as bad as, as art museums. And I think that probably drives a lot of deaccessioning in art museums. It certainly is in the United States. A lot of museums now are looking at culling objects out of their collection in order to raise funds to cover budget shortfalls. Yeah, it's an interesting dilemma if you think about that. Oh, yes. Because I, and I know the AAM, they, they loosen the deaccessioning the guidelines, right? No, it was AMD. It's the, AMD, sorry, yeah. it's the Association of America of, of Art Museum Directors. Yeah, exactly. And actually, the way that was reported was incorrect because it was widely reported in the press that they had loosened their guidelines and they were going to allow deaccessioning and sale of art, art objects to use those funds to make up budget shortfalls over the next two years because of the COVID problem. And that is actually not true. If you look at the statement on the AMD's website, what they changed was they said you can use the proceeds from endowed funds that are for purchasing art to you, you can use that money for other things over the next two years years and you will not be sanctioned. They did not say that you could start deaccessioning collection objects and using, but that it appeared even in the New York Times got it wrong. The mm. Times and the Washington Post both said, oh, they've changed the rules on deaccessioning. You can do whatever you want. That, that is incorrect. But those are ethical principles, not legal ones. So, you know, there's nothing to stop a museum from deaccessioning art and selling it and using the money however they want. Especially Legally. if they're not funded by any yeah. government. But it's rather like being lost in the woods at night and lighting your map on fire with a match so you can see where you are. It's kind of pointless. Uh. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's it's a different, if, it's um, probably a whole, another hour of talking about this because it is interesting if you're, if, if you want to, to save your museum for keeping your uh, employees at work or to save the collection and its heritage because you think that's far more important than that because it it, it exceeds a lot of lifetimes but it's right. at times but yeah i i think that's a very good point but you can also do great damage to your museum's collection by doing that if you have a director come in who thinks that picasso was not important and usually it's not Picasso, usually it's some other artists that they pick, but the, you, you can have directors or curators who for some reason deaccession things they're not interested in personally rather than things that will not damage the museum collection. I think that's where the problems begin. But it happens the other way around as well. There are curators that accession things because they're interested in it and it doesn't fit exactly. the mission of the museum. And, and then you're stuck, yes. Exactly. Well, so I guess, my question to the group would be, 
and, and Didi, I'm sure the answer for you is yes, because you consult with people about this all the time. But for other folks here, have you all engaged in or are you currently engaged in some sort of formal deaccessioning process? I mean, I will tell you at the fish collection in the Florida Museum, the curator has wanted for many things to be accessioned for a long time and has particularly unsorted, uncatalogued materials, things that have net been processed and has pushed hard and uh, done some of that work himself and involved me in it. And now as we prepare to move to a new building, which surprise, surprise, does not deliver all the space that we were promised it would, and space continues to be at a premium, he's throwing things out that um, I know for a fact he's not as well informed about as I am. And also, to be fair, there's things that um, I probably overvalue that should be discarded. And so, we end up in a situation where it's, it's civil and it's fine, but we're not really progressing in an orderly fashion. And maybe we should hire Didi. I don't know. But are, are, are the rest of you, are you having experience trying to formally clean, clean up shop? That's something or that I've been working on. Go ahead. For the past couple of years here is I've been trying to do inventory of our collection and get rid of things, uh, which has been really interesting uh, because in my personal life, I'm a hoarder. And as I was going into the museum field, I did not realize how much joy it would give me to throw things away. Um, because we, we're a really small local history museum. We have a full-time staff of two people. Uh, and there's been a lot of staff turnover over the years, and there's been really bad uh, cases of founder syndrome. Uh, and we have a lot of things in the collection that really should not have ever been accepted. Uh, but the problem that I've been encountering is because of the high rate of staff turnover and the lack of professional staff for many years, uh, I have really shaky provenance for most of the things that I would like to get rid of. Uh, so I'm kind of stuck with them for now. Uh, so that is something that is added to my long-term project list of whenever I actually finish this inventory and get my list together, I'm trying to go back and figure out where these things came from so I can actually get rid of them. Because they're, they're taking up so much space that I do not I'm never going to be able to. Well, if you don't mind me uh, reacting upon your question, Rob, I think we here in Anelis try to, um, uh, how do you call that? The, the fact that one person is making a decision of the accessioning or not. In the Netherlands, we always try to make a group of experts or museum experts or even experts from outside your own uh, institute to talk about the the reasons why you want to take session. So there's always, as we call, intersubjective decision being made in which some people can safeguard you from your own emotions to say so because you you uh, uh, hold something in high regard. And the other way around, if if some other people know more about objects than you do, they can tell you, well, what you're doing right now is not a really smart thing to do. And I don't know if it would give you some space to talk about the decisions being made, but it helps a lot that you're not the only one responsible because that's a fear as well. Yeah, can... we, we uh, our, our faculty are given total autonomy over the collections. So it really what gets done to a large degree with the collections is, um, I'll be careful in how I word this, not because it's a sensitive issue, but because I want to get it right. But the functioning relationships within any division in the museum are going to greatly influence what comes in and what goes out, right? And um, personality really has a lot to do with that as well. And I, I find myself in a situation, and just as an example for institutions, because we're talking about museums in general, right? Not just in our own particular cases, Know, where I actually hold more institutional knowledge uh, than the person in charge, right? And so I know what some of these codes on labels mean, 
And what the person in charge knows is that that jar has been there a long time and he or she doesn't understand the value of it, but just knows that it's taking up space. You know, some of those codes say this thing came from the deep sea of the Bahamas 50 years ago and has rare, in, in rare animals in it. And even if their condition is not great, they may be the only examples and fewest examples of that species in museums. And a lot of this stuff is getting pitched after hours. Um, mm -hmm. So I just, you know, that's, I, again, I don't mean to make this about my particular situation, but I think about museums in general, it would be nice if we had a practice in place, what you're talking about, Didi, where museums as a whole agreed that that's a committee-like level of responsibility because as somebody said earlier, and I think maybe it was you, Didi, these specimens are about way more than our particular likes and dislikes they're supposed to be here for centuries after we're gone. They, you know, we're just the custodians. Mm -hmm. so. But then it's super important that you, if you're the only one who knows what these numbers are, start doing something with knowledge management, because if you're gone, nobody knows. And then the accessioning is going to happen because there is no knowledge yeah. left. Yeah, and, and, and you're absolutely right. And that the same token, you know, again, this could be said for the collections at the Cal Acad. I know the ichthyology collections there are massive. There's one collection manager and he's been there for longer than I have, right? Yeah. And I'm quite sure he's just as busy, right? <laughs> yeah. And it always seems like whether something gets thrown out or whether you give careful consideration to whether something comes in doesn't make it up that that ladder very high. So I, I don't mean to be throwing up obstacles. I'm just trying to work my way through this. No, I think it's a good point because I have seen a bad deaccessioning example at a, at a museum that I once worked with where a curator who was new to the collection made the decision to throw out a few specimens, I mean, quite literally in the dumpster, not deaccessioning them, but just dumping them that turned out to be figured specimens. So they were fossils in this case. And that uh, uh, makes the specimen a lot more valuable. That means images have been published in the literature of it. And that was a, a terrible mistake that that curator wound up having to buy them back from a rock shop because uh, somebody was dumpster diving and found them and sold them and recognized them for worse that they recognized them as having been in the publication. So that's pretty embarrassing. Uh, on the other hand, I have a client right now and I, I cannot say who they are because they are a client but it's a museum that is a, a state museum and they had two or three museums all in, un, under one name and one of them dealt with industrial things and another was a science center and two of them need to be closed for budgetary reasons and that was quite clear so they they brought me in at the point where they had already made their deaccessioning decisions but had not acted on them and what they wanted was an outsider to look at what they had done. And they had done it the right way. They had formed a committee within the museum. They had gotten some community input. They had found that they could take the industrial material and that could go intact, all of it, <clears throat> to another person, to another institution, a 501c3 a museum. And then of the, the other stuff included the things like mounted animals and some ethnographic artifacts. And that's where it got a little, a little dicey. Some of the stuff was from Australia and we are still working on whether any of that should or can be repatriated to Australia. But basically they had done everything right in forming the committee. They had made the right decisions. And so my role was really simple. I looked over every, all of the documentation and had several discussions and an on-site visit to look at things and everything was, was done right. But that having that group work rather than individuals made a big difference because there was always someone in the group who recognized something about the objects that argued for or against deaccessioning them. So I, I think Didi's point is very good. That group decision um, covers a, can, can prevent a lot of mistakes. Yeah, along the, the article, I, I realized the, the big importance of the collections management policy and about all those group decisions. And, and yeah, before they didn't have like any, any guideline, any policy. So um, like everything starts from the gift because donors used to literally drop their collection at the museum door. And, and after they realized that some gift uh, turned out to be fake, or poor quality, 
but museums has to store and cares for them on their person's will. And this session requires permission from uh, his ex executors. Yeah. And the last of them died in 1962. So I wonder, so I wonder if, if nowadays is there is there is a solution to face this kind of legal constraints or what do you do in this? There, if you've got a legal document on the accession that says that the museum has to maintain the collection in perpetuity or other restrictions, the only way to do it is to, is to hire a lawyer and go to court. And you can use what's called the CPRE doctrine, which can be used to, to uh, break the purposes of a will. The most famous example of CPRE doctrine in the United States is probably um, the uh, art museum in, in Philadelphia, the uh, Oh, I now forget the guy's name, the guy that started the art school with, with John Dewey and had the fabulous collection of Impressionist art from the 20s. And uh, it was, his idea was never to have a museum, it was to have an art school and this stuff was to be hung on the walls for the art school, but he's long dead and so they finally, the uh, that was all that will was taken to court and contested and overturned and uh, what, what he did not, what the owner founder did not want is what happened, it's, it's now a big art museum. Uh, in in downtown Philadelphia, but that's the that's the only way to do it legally is to go to court. Yeah, but it depends I, on the terms that you're dealing with. And I am um, because you have to kind of the same problem, Caitlin, in, in your museum that you don't know the provenance. Um, I think I always I'm on, most of the times on the light side. I think if you've done your due diligence and you've asked the public and nobody knows anything, then I say, well, please, the accession it if you're not gonna use it, but how do you think about that? Yeah. You, all of you. Yeah. I just looked it up, it's the Barnes Foundation is the name I couldn't remember, so yes. Because uh, Barnes did not want to, his, he did not like museums and did not want his stuff in a museum and that is where it wound up due to the terms of his will, which were extremely difficult to comply with. Didi, to answer your question, I think it's yeah. obviously a hard one because it speaks to having to assess value, right? Right. Um, it seems like for art museums and cultural museums, you know, if you deaccession an object and then find out later that it had tremendous value, well, then obviously you somehow made an error, right? Even if it doesn't fit with the vision of your institution, whereas it seems like for me, for natural history museums, you deaccession something, knowing that it likely has some future scientific value, which is very different than dollars and cents value, right, or euros value, um, because it's just, it's harder to quantify. I mean, I can argue that those specimens from the deep sea of the Bahamas cost X amount of dollars to collect, but as we all know, can't tell you what the value is of describing a new species or publishing a paper that informed us about the diet of a little known obscure deep sea fish. So I think it becomes easier for people in natural history museums to eventually justify deaccessioning stuff because it is so hard to assess the value that it's very unlikely at any time somebody's going to come along later and tell you how badly you screwed up to the tune of two million dollars at Sotheby's, right? I mean, that's yeah. probably an uh, oversimplification. I realize mm -hmm. that's not likely to happen as much. But I think that money should never be a reason to deaccession. I think your collection's profile should be the reason to deaccession. Well, yeah, I, I, I love that, but I think that's exactly the opposite of how we operate, right? The whole way our institution grows collections, and I suspect this is true for most natural history museums, is what you can get funding for, right? Like we didn't seek to be the best collection of freshwater fishes from Southeast Asia. We're the Florida Museum of Natural History for Christ's sake. But we are now because there was money from a particular division of the biggest funding agency and our professionals were keenly uh, you know, suited to apply for it and get it. And so we did. Yeah. And so 
that's why we did that because it was money to do it, right? And at, at least that seems to be the model in university museums, but it may be very different at public, private institutions. You know, I think Didi's correct that de the disposal should be separate from the deaccessioning. And if you read the deaccessioning literature, at least at the United States, they all make that argument, but frequently the value is placed as the primary uh, consideration in deaccessioning, and it should not be. Because you can deaccession, and any you can do any number of things with a deaccessioned object, including destroying it, giving it to another institution, or selling it. There's you know, one of those will get you money and one will not, but the value, the monetary value of the object should not be considered at the, at the deaccession. It should be whether it fits your museum mission or not. Is it supportive of your museum? Is it necessary in the museum? In, in terms of, of your example, Rob, I think that the argument would be made in a natural history museum that natural history museums like to think of themselves as international resources. And you may not have a curator right now who's working on deep sea fish from the Bahamas, but someone does and those those people can still access that collection to work on it, even though that's not your curators. I went through a very wrenching change when I was still at University of Kansas in that regard because uh, throughout, I was there 26 years and throughout most of that, we were the big center for uh, uh, South American herpetology. We had the biggest collections from uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, a number of countries in South America. And we had a lot of South American students come, a lot of visitors, and those curators retired and the new curators don't work there. And one of them works in Southeast Asia and another in, in the Caribbean. And so that means the, the collect, nature of the collection, the incoming material is totally changed. But the collect the material is still there to be used, but it's it's it is not as used as it once was because of the change in curators. But the change in curators doesn't mean you should change the entire collection. It doesn't mean you should go back and deaccession all of that South American material to another institution necessarily, because that can change again in the future. But you have another problem with art, which is fluctuating prices. Because if you're talking old masters or Picasso, those prices are probably going to be reasonably steady in the art market in the foreseeable future. But there is an argument made, and I happen to have the book here because I talked to a, a class about this last week, which is called, uh, it's called Museum Inc. Inside the Global Art World. And it's written by a guy that was once a... Uh, a, a, a guide at uh, the Guggenheim. And he makes the argument you. that, yeah, he makes the argument that a lot of modern art is actually made to be in a museum. It's, it's made for that purpose. And what museums take and do not take directly affects the value of that art. And so by taking that art into the museum, it drives the price up. And this, this puts a whole new aspect on deaccessioning. And at that, I think to a degree that's true with any object that's ever been in a museum, whether it's natural history our history or anything, if, if, if it is deaccessioned as from the former museum or from that museum, it seems to have a, a higher value. But in the case, he makes this interesting case for modern art that most, much of it was, in his opinion, designed to be put into an art museum and therefore have its value increased, which kind of changes things. But the, you know, the art world is famous for fluctuating values. But what does it change? Because if you still act for, uh if you still do accession for, for your collection's profile, then monetary value is not an issue. That's correct. So and and I think that is the ideal, but I, I agree with Rob, that's not what most museums seem to be doing in the US. They mm -hmm. seem to be looking at the value they can derive from the, the sale, from the disposal. But that is, that distinction should be clear, in, in my opinion, in policy that deaccessioning and disposal should not be linked. They should be separate. And you make your deaccessioning decision based on what fits your collection. You then make your deaccessioning, your de disposal decision, whether you're going to sell something or give it to another institution yeah. after you've made your deaccessioning decision, yeah. not before. It's so interesting because in the Netherlands, as a museum, you're obliged to offer to other museums for free for yeah. eight weeks. And then museums have eight weeks of time to think about it if they want it or not. And then after the eight weeks, you're free to sell or destroy or whatever you want to do. So there's an extra layer in the whole process of keeping it in the public domain. Because you have, of course, a lot of private museums. Mm -hmm. But it is, um, we, we have, we have yeah. tried a lot with the accessioning here and it didn't always work out fine. So we've been 
working on our guidelines and trying to prohibit failures. I think I have to qualify one of my statements before because I'm, you know, I'm so tunnel visioned, right? I've just lived in the same <laughs> place for so long. And when I think of deaccessioning, I don't ever think of stuff that we assigned to catalog number two. To me, that material part of the register is in a way inviolate. The only way I'm deaccessioning it is if it rotted, if, you know, we did a poor job and it had to be discarded physically. And even then I keep the data. Um, for us, it's been kind of circling around to what we talk, talked about the back at the beginning, all that material that we never should have taken on in the first place, because quite frankly, we didn't have the resources to, to give it the proper treatment. Um, so that's, that's largely what I'm speaking of when I talk about deaccessioning. And, and we do that for space. Right, you know, for art museums, it might be again these questions of value, actual monetary value. But for us, the thing with the most monetary value is space. You know, we're so desperate for space because these collections keep growing. And time of people, of yeah. yeah, yeah, resources, yeah, yeah. But then, if if the objects were never registered, uh, can you deaccession them? Because if nobody knows you have them, you can just throw them away. Yeah, I'm conflating deaccession with disposal, and I apologize for that. That's just been my 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 view. But I know the I know the value of those things. You know, just because they're not identified and given a catalog or in the database, I can do it. I could do it pretty quickly. But all this over here that I'm already doing, right? And it's not like it's one jar; it's hundreds. And I've been doing it, and I and I love it. And it's been a process. Right? Um, I think any of us who have pulled things out of the the backlog, so to speak, and brought it to the light of day. And then later in their career, seen it borrowed and used, that's very productive. Mm -hmm. And one, one moral personal question for all of you. Do you regard um, transfer it to another museum as a form of deaccessioning in which your museum loses something? Or do you think it's more like uh, working together to help each other with collections? Yeah, you see me shaking my head. No, as, as long as science benefits, I'm fine with it. So, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, coming yeah. from the history perspective, it definitely, I, if it's something that's not just piece of junk, um, which a lot of things are hard. I don't hear you very well. Am I the only one? No, you're breaking up. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure which one it's pulling from. My headphones are the phone. Can you hear me better now? That's better. Um, so coming from a history perspective, um, it's really gratifying when I can give something to another museum that's a better home for it. Um, so that's, as long as it's not something that's just a piece of junk that no other museum in their right mind is going to want, um, that's the, the preference for what I would like to do with it, if possible. So it's, oh. that's definitely, what I would prefer to do um, for things that are actually of uh, value to another institution. Dee, Dee you, you may know this already, and I, I suspect a lot of the natural history people here do as well, but a perverse twist on that is that we routinely collect new materials of specimens that our researchers process and publish on, describing new species knowing that the name bearing specimen, the type specimen will have to be deposited in an institution in the country of origin that does not have the long-term trajectory or the standards of collection care that our institution does or that even some other sister or partner institutions do just because of international law. So you know, there, there's nothing more important for the stability of scientific names and those type specimens and yet off it goes into some jar literally on the floor in some closet where you know access to it is limited at best and it's yeah. so sometimes we do the process knowing even still that it's worse for science yikes yeah, well, if you, that's parallel with uh, the repatriation of the non-Western stuff museums have in, in Europe. Everybody says, if we give it back, it will be lost forever. And then I think, well, we stole it somewhere somehow. <laughs> Maybe we should give it back and decide then what's going to happen. 
it's super difficult as a as a as a museum profession that you're so used to your high standards to give away these high standards and, and have other standards on your objects but in the in the realm of their ori original situation and i understand your frustration because it is super frustrating but I, on the other hand i think well they well, yeah we're not we're not even giving back we're never even taking it in the first yeah. place right no, no, yeah. and well, and i've i've been to these institutions you know i mean i see yeah, I mean, sometimes we're talking dirt floors. Yeah, but you can also make the argument. You can also make the argument that the holotype is the best known specimen out of that for that species. It is the most described, the most detailed, and there is a process in place for naming a neotype. So if you're going to lose yeah. a specimen, you're better off to lose the holotype than lose a brand new specimen you just collected and haven't identified yet. Because you can, nice replace, you can replace the holotype and you can use that description to identify other members of the species. But I, I do this experiment or this conversation when I t teach classes on collection management for natural history. I ask them, what are the most valuable specimens of your collection? Inevitably, they say the holotypes. And I point out, no, those are the least valuable because you already know what they are and they're well described in the literature and you can always name a neotype. The most valuable are the ones that just arrived from the field and they're over there in a bucket on the counter and you have no idea what's in there that's the most valuable because that's what's going to be new to science i will, I will no one ever agrees but no i will i will agree with you <laughs> most of the way you know what my, my <laughs> counter arguments could be right and they're they're mostly on a case-by-case -case basis so yeah 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 New species from a single specimen. That's what I think. Mean. No, I, I don't mean to denigrate the importance of no. holotypes and not all, particularly older ones were not all described very well. And I have been in the position of having actually discovered a lost holotype by accident. I was, was looking at a museum in Medellin that had been part of a high school that had been closed for years and, and going through the museum, which we finally found guards to let us in. I was on another project. We had an afternoon to kill. We went to find this place. Looking, I glanced down at a jar and there was a name I recognized because a student at Kansas happened to be working on that group. And I knew that was his holotype. And he, hit, he thought it was lost because he had commented wow. to me just casually one day. So I went home, I emailed him and I said, Juan, I found your holotype, here it is. And the next day he had a friend over there photographing it. So it had a happy ending, but you know, it's, it was a weird thing to do. But <laughs> yeah, I know mm -hmm. how important those can be. So I have not there Sarah or Marie a lot. What are your thoughts about the <laughs> Um, well, I think I don't I can't really speak to other departments at the academy because I'm not familiar with their processes, but, um, you know, in geology, of course, our ongoing issue has been space. Um, ever since we moved into this new building in 2008, we've, you know, we started running out of space when we moved in. Um, and our collection, our collections is shared with invertebrate zoology, so it's an even tighter space for us sharing with their dry collections. Um, and I, um, I think our, our collections manager in geology now, she came in uh, about two years ago and she's been actively trying to make more space and deaccession things, um, deaccession specimens to Rob's point that don't have good data or value, any sort of valuable data. Again, if we don't know what something is, where it was collected, um that it's pretty useless to us um so we'll move things to our teaching collection more often than actually deaccessioning um but now of course our teaching collection is running out of space so <laughs> <laughs> we do need to actually once we're back in the building we do need to start going through that and start deaccessioning um my collections manager also brought up a good point which is something i've been thinking about which is um you know with covid and um you know, these kind of reports coming out that about 30% of museums in America will be closing, we're starting to think about what happens so that the small natural history museum, you know, in the middle of California that has to close and needs to um, send their collection somewhere, like, should we start making space so that we can take on these, um, these smaller collections from other institutions. So that's something that we're 
really actively thinking about and we'll probably start working on when we're back in the building just in the event that you know these museums do actually start closing can we take on their collections they're not lost forever that's a task yeah that is a good point we had we opened a new facility in 2003 that's when our big collections facility opened and the herbarium part of it is like 85 percent full now in part because once we opened and we had all of this space smaller collections that were closing sent their <laughs> stuff to us <laughs> they said you have all this room can you take our stuff um and I guess I have a couple of different thoughts banging around in my head. One is that maybe we are operating, at least in natural history collections, on different definitions of accessioning and deaccessioning because um, I guess, unlike Rob, if something doesn't already have a, a catalog number, I don't consider it to have been accessioned. So we have several herbarium cabinets of material. One is full of stuff that somebody sent us, unidentified plants of Argentina. And we don't have an Argentinian botanist, you know, an someone who's an expert on Argentinian plants in our faculty or our grad students or anything. And I would, now that we're trying to go through some of our backlog, that's what we call all this stuff. I, you know, I'm probably just going to box it up and, and send it to Argentina for, for them to have because it's not particularly useful for us, but I don't consider that deaccessioning because we never put it in the collections to begin with. Um, but I also think this really highlights the necessity for natural history collections and smaller museums to have really explicit guidelines for accessioning and deaccessioning. So we, in our collections policies, we're super clear about if you give us stuff, it belongs to the state of Connecticut and we can do whatever we want with it. You know, we can keep it or we can give it away. We have a committee that re makes reviews of any decisions about deaccessioning things, which we haven't done yet, but as we get full, we might have to do. Um, and we have very clear rules about what items even would be eligible to deaccession. And then separate from that, once a decision has been made, what are the possible ways that we can dispose of this object? And right, we, our first priority is teaching collections, then it's other research collections in the region, and then it's other research collections outside the region. So we have, um, it's super clear. I feel like if we wanted to deaccession something, we would know exactly what we had to do to get it done, which makes me feel a lot better than than finding out that all of a sudden some specimens ended up in the dumpster. Thank you. Yeah, and to, to reiterate, I apologize. I, I really was just thinking about disposal. I don't consider things accessioned either until they get a catalog number. I guess even some sub disciplines within the museum have an accessioning stage before cataloging, right? Where like this donation from John Simmons of these specimens that he collected in this month in Columbia is an accession. Mm -hmm. And then within that are the catalog objects. So we don't, we don't do that. So. Well, legally, okay. yeah, legally accessioned means you, you have made it a permanent part of your collection and that would require you therefore to have all of the proper permits and paperwork and, and all of that because you can't deaccession things you you have not accessioned you can get rid of things if you're not if you can prove you you were the owner but uh that's there there's a line that is drawn but most in most museums you have an accessioning policy that lays out your criteria for accessioning and that cataloging is a subsequent step that is not equivalent to deaccessioning, but it, but in some cases that's part of the process. But it, it varies quite a bit from one museum to another. In natural history, we rely far more on the cataloging process as a means of identifying our individual objects than they do in an art museum or a history museum. And that has to do again with the scale that we're working on. But you know, the definition of catalog means put into category. That's, it's not the same as, as accessioning, which means to take possession of. 
But if you look in Marie Malaro, the Malaro and DeAngelis uh, legal primer on managing museum collections, you'll find a good definition of accessioning and that distinction between taking ownership and not is, is there for US law. Internationally, I don't know, but at least for US law. Thanks. And Rob, don't, don't apologize, no worries, because this is the idea of this group, no? To this yeah, Rob, to, yeah. to ask. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just so familiar with so. my uh, uh, my abundant failings that I'm used to apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's something I do. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, that's exactly why I'm here, is to learn. It's good. <laughs> Um, okay, I would like to wrap up this meetup with a question that I have uh, about the article. Um, um, the author was pointing out at the beginning about a lucrative tax deductions, and it's something that I still don't <laughs> understand. So my, my question is, when a donor gives um, the collection to a museum, does the donor get tax deductions because the donor is contrib contributing to a nonprofit institution? Under US law, the nonprofit sector, what in our, in our tax code, the section is called 501c3, and that's people tend to use that as a phrase, but that's actually identifies a section of US tax law. It says that if you're a 501c3 institution, you're a nonprofit and you, you in some way work for the public good. So you do some benefit. So that could be, usually those are arts organizations. So ballet, a symphony orchestra, a theater, a museum. These are all things that are considered to be in existence for the betterment of the public. So they are exempted from certain taxes, not all taxes, but certain taxes to en enable them to function. And if you make a donation to a 501c3, it is something you own and you give it to them, you then have the option of receiving a tax benefit. How much of a benefit you get depends on your income, how much you've earned, how, many, how much you're paying in taxes that year, that becomes a legal matter. And that is between you and the Internal Revenue Service, between you and the tax collecting service. So when a museum receives an object, they will give you a receipt that says, yes, we are a 501c3, we have received this object, we thank you for this gift. But they do not, they are not legally allowed to put a value on the gift. The owner of the gift has to establish the value. And and there are a number of ways that gets done depending on how big the value is. But as a museum then, as a 501c3, you should keep that object for three years before you get rid of it. If you get rid of it before that period, you have to file a paper, a file, a form with the Internal Revenue Service explaining that you no longer have it and that then the person who donated it to you may have part of their tax benefit revoked. But um, that's, that's how it works. It, the, the tax benefit depends entirely on the finances of the donor, but it has to be a free and clear gift to a tax deductible organization, a 501c3. It's, it's, it's rather complicated and that's not a system that exists in very few other countries. It's, it's pretty much unique to the United States. Yeah, and, and Laura, in the United States, you can report values to the IRS that are based in fact or not. It doesn't matter okay. until, until they find out. And, well, um, <laughs> the IRS law actually, IRS requires you to establish a written value if it's over $500. And when you get up over a thousand, you're required to get an outside appraisal for your tax purposes. So if you get audited and you haven't done that, you'll get caught. I think right. Dee was right. gonna- But my point is you don't have to do it. You uh, just, yeah, you don't have listen. to. This is what's playing out in the news right now. You yeah, well, otherwise you'll wind up like our beloved president. You can roll the dice yes. and hope it never <laughs> catches up with you. And maybe yeah, it won't. You can. And you could fight it in court forever and ever. Mm, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> All right, I said too much. Didi, were you going to say something? No, no, we have the same system. In oh, the you had your finger up. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. No, because of, we have the same system. Oh, okay, good. And I think even if you if you die here and you, you bequeath your collection to the state, then you get a lot of tax reducing on your um, heritage to your children. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hmm. we try to make culture as accessible as possible. Yeah, well, here you, it's not to the state, although you can also do that. But we, in addition to the state, you can bequeath to a a 
public uh, nonprofit organization. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, interesting, guys. It's really, I've, I've, I've never talked with natural history people about the accessioning. <laughs> And it is interesting because I was asked to talk about the accession with our, for our biggest natural history museum, the Naturalis in Leiden. I don't know if you know. Oh it. yeah, of course. Um, of course. So it's good. I've been there. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> I think they have 48 million objects mm -hmm. in, in at the whole of Netherlands in public museums have 76. So. Highly digitized. <laughs> Yeah, and they're, they're working on it. And I'm really interested in knowing why they want to take session and how they are planning to do it, how they are going to make their decisions. Because yeah, well, I know they have a serious space problem. That's always, that's what it is. Yeah, and and, and right now they have more objects than they have personnel to take care of. Yeah. And they, objects have been packed so tightly that they cannot monitor the condition. And that's my big complaint with naturalis is you cannot check on the specimens and see whether they're deteriorating or not because they have them so densely packed. But at the time they made that decision, I guess they had no other choice. So they just, they just built a new storage space. But they haven't moved into it yet. Uh, I, well, I don't know. Yeah, see, I was there a few years ago when they had vacated their original space and gone into the dense storage and at that point had not had, did not have the funds for the new space and I've not been back. I was there in, I think, 2012 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thanks, Laura, for organizing. Uh, this is our second meetup, and the idea is that I would like to have like a product or uh, like a reflection after each meetup. So it will be nice if you can submit to the um, to our circle. Uh, or send me to on my email and I'm going to meet to, the, to our network um, like a photo or a quote or um, I don't know something meaningful for you about uh, this meetup so it would be it would be great to have like a souvenir for for this like a reflection or something <laughs> I, yeah. Yes, I, I learned that John wants to be a frog. <laughs> <laughs> Some say I'm already there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. Thank Very you. nice to meet everybody. Nice and good to meet you guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you if you ever have questions, mm -hmm. let me know. I'm always willing to talk. Uh -huh. All right. Great. Yeah. I may Thank reach you. out. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye.